go to the green room. Yeah. Mother's Day.
morning and welcome to our worship service here in Deland, Florida of New Light Church. Uh, just as a reminder, our members of our church are supporting this uh, online Facebook ministry. So we are happy that you have joined us. And uh, if you do not have a church home, we encourage you to watch week by week as we have uh, decided to go ahead and broadcast this uh, even when our congregation returns. 
and we're hoping that uh, uh, many of them will be able to return next week. So uh, if you are a member uh, and you feel safe, please plan to come back and let us worship together in person. We continue to use the uh, pandemic guidelines and uh, here at the church we have uh, hand sanitizer and other precautionary measures uh, for your safety and for your comfort. Uh, I continue to thank uh, the staff and that is Pam and Alan and Mr. B and Fawn for making this service possible and uh, they're doing uh, most of the work and I appreciate it and I know that you do. So welcome today and we hope that this will be a worshipful experience and that God will bless you and will bless your home.
Some of you this morning will be praying in memory. Others will be praying in honor of. But we want to take this time to remember our mothers, whether they are still living or whether they have deceased. Uh, God ordained motherhood, and uh, we want to remember and honor that this morning. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Good morning, our most gracious Heavenly Father, our Redeemer, our Comforter. We have gathered together here both in this room and in our individual homes. Our purpose this day of worship is to have our souls renewed, refreshed, and confirmed. We present ourselves to you to listen to your words of life, praying that they will feed our spiritual bodies. Thank you for inviting us into your presence. We ask not that we, that you come into our presence, but rather we are able to come into your presence. Help us this morning to meditate on your precepts. Open our eyes that we may see, and open our ears that we may hear. Remove us from the ways of the world and teach us to discern good from evil. Be with us as we travel down our road of life. We do confess at times that we find ourselves taking detours, but with your guidance and with your presence we will quickly return to your road of righteousness. We do lift up all of those that are in sickness and sorrow. We lift up those that are caretakers. We know that you are aware of all of our needs, but like a good father, you want your children to ask. So we do that. We pray for all of those who or on the front medical lines, protecting, researching, and rendering care and comfort. We pray for all the men and women who are serving our country in uniform. We pray for all of the emergency responders, for those who have kept their retail stores open that we may eat and secure essential items. We lift up this morning all of those who are prayer warriors, those that many times are forgotten. We lift up those responders and medical teams, but also those prayer warriors that are sending up prayers of comfort and strength and encouragement. We remember all of the pastors throughout our Christian world this day, who are continuing to offer opportunities to worship, even through technology. Thank you for giving us hope, no matter what the circumstances may be, for we know that you are watching over us and preparing us for
for being with you forever. And now, wherever you are, let us pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Hear our prayer, God above, as we come to you and seek your patient love. Hear our
during this time of uh, pandemic, separation from family and friends, trying to weigh what our Christian response should be, whether it's responding to what our government has suggested, how much we should be doing for others and our friends and our family. I thought today that an appropriate scripture would be coming to us from the book of Galatians, the sixth chapter. As we watch news, as we read the newspaper, as we hear people talking, much, many times the conversation is, how much should we do? And what should we do? So our scripture this morning comes to us from the book of Galatians, the sixth chapter, in verses one through five. If you have your Bibles at home, please open up to Galatians, the sixth chapter, verses one through five. Listen to these words. Brethren, the Apostle Paul uses that word, brethren, but he only uses it when he's talking to other Christians. He does not use it when he's talking to the general public. So whenever we see that word, brethren, used, we know that he's talking about and talking to the men and women of the body of Christ. So this is the first command that he gives. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work. That's accountability. That's self-responsibility. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. That almost seems like a contradiction from the verses that we read just a few verses up uh, before that. But yes, as Christians, we are here to help each other and to share the burden, but not to take that burden. In the English version of our scripture this morning, it says this. It says, help carry one another's burdens does not say to carry the burdens, but rather it says to help carry the burdens. As Christians, we have been called to help, not take over. The old cliche is give a man a fish and he will live for a day. Teach him how to fish and he will be able to live better and will be able to feed himself. When we try and attempt to handle someone's burdens, Many times the result is making them dependent or codependent. I know that as a pastor, I have had many, many, many occasions to make a death call, to go to the home of one that has deceased. When I go there, I do not attempt to take the grieving away from the loved ones in the family. But rather, I feel like that my position and responsibility is to help them proceed through the grieving process. I am empathetic. I am sympathetic. But I must allow them to go through their own hurt and their own pain. I fear at times that we as a nation are making many dependent. I know that some of our senior people and some of our older people now are are scared to death. And I do hold our government and do hold many of those officials 
who are giving out conflicting reports and we as lay people really don't know what to believe or where to turn, what we should do. Allowing others to go through their own valley of the shadow of death matures them. There's going to have to be a time where we are able to regather together. From what we hear from most scientists is that, the, that this virus is going to be with us now forever. It's never going to be completely eradicated. Hopefully and prayerfully, it will be brought down, though, to a manageable process and that we can all begin to act normal. The word that bothers me a little bit as a citizen, as a pastor, is the word that we hear flung around, the new normal. Who's going to tell us what that new normal is? Who is going to tell us what our responsibilities and obligations are of helping our fellow men and women and children? Is it going to be our government? Or is it going to be the body of Christ, the church? Of course, we respect. Of course, we want to hear from those experts. Of course, we want to hear from the medical world but we want what we hear to be separated from opinion and bias and economics. Allowing others, as we said, to be able to go through their time of mourning and grief and heartache, it matures them and it aids in being able to deal with hardship. It also allows others to make mistakes in their vital growth. As we attempt to help our brothers and sisters, we need to allow them at times to make their own mistakes. I remember many, many years ago, it was Christmas morning. My son, Rick, wanted a special kit that uh, you could put together, and it was uh, made up of little cars, and it would run over this track. Of course, some assembly was required. I felt like that my son was not mature enough and not old enough and did not have the, the uh, mechanical expertise to put this together, but he was excited about it when he opened up the package. I could look into his eyes and see the twinkle and the glee and got exactly what he had asked for. As I began to watch him fumble around with the pieces of track, I pushed him away and I said, here son, let me show you how to do it. After a few moments, I looked beside me and my son was not there anymore. I looked back and he was sitting on the couch and no longer was that glimmer of happiness and joy there. I had taken it away from him. We need to learn how as a country, spiritually and physically, medically and economically, we need to allow people to make their own mistakes. And through the mistakes, they will learn valuable lessons of life. In helping other people, we, we cannot take the attitude that we're going to fix their problems or maybe even change their situations. There are people that have been negatively trained by, I hate to say this, but by the church. The attitude seems to be many times they come to the church and, and their voice says, I have a problem. What are you going to do with it? I have a problem. What are you going to do about it? I was sitting in my office one day in a church that I had been appointed to, and to protect the name of the church, I will not mention it, but it was many years ago in the particular area that I was in was a very highly transit area. Sitting in my office and the secretary walked up to my door and said, there's a lady here to see you and she wants to talk with you. And I said, fine, send her in. So this attractive blonde haired lady came in and I asked her to have a seat and I asked her, what can I do to help you? She said, well, I have a problem and I'm bringing it to the church and I want you to help me get my problem fixed. And I said, okay, what's your problem? 
And she said, I need a ride to Miami and I want you to take me there. And I said, well, I can appreciate your predicament and your problem, but it would not be appropriate and I really cannot put you in the car, in my car, and take you to Miami. She said, that's your job as a pastor. You're here to help me and to help take care of my problems. And I said, I will do all that I can do in all of my power to help you, but I cannot put you in my car and take you to Miami. She said, well, you're not a very good pastor, and I'm going to find out somebody that I can call and tell them how bad a pastor you are. And I said, okay, you do what you have to do. Well, it wasn't 30 minutes. The phone rang. The secretary came online and said, Rick, the bishop is on the line wanting to talk to you. I get nervous. I begin to stutter. My blood pressure goes up. What does the bishop want to do with me? Why does he want to talk to me? I answered the phone. And I said, yes, Bishop. <clears throat> and he said, how are you doing today? I said, I'm doing fine. How are you doing? He said, I understand that you have a little problem there. And I thought, what could he be talking about? I said, sir, not, not to my knowledge. I think nothing ever goes exactly the way the preacher wants it. But I think we had a pretty smooth running ministry. He said, I understand that a young lady just came into your office a few minutes ago asking for help, and you denied her. Now I want to hear your side of the story. I thought for a moment, my side of the story? Well, I do have a little temper, and I've been known to give in to a little anger. But I thought twice, and I was talking to my spiritual superior. And I said, sir, I don't know what to tell you, but I did all that was in my power to help this lady. And I told her that I could not put her in my car and take her to Miami. His response was, have a nice day. Now for the rest of the story, I want to tell you who that woman was. It was Eileen Warno one of the first women ever put to death by the state of Florida for killing, we still don't know how many men alongside the roads of Florida. Now, can you imagine if I would have put that lady in my vehicle and started to take her to Miami? I might not be standing here this morning. You see, there is a limit when we're called to help and help others that we're, use, we're to use reasoning were to use discernment. And at that moment, I did not feel it would have been the right thing to do. You see, I am an honest man, and I'm not going to steal your problem. And if you're trying to give me your problem as a gift, no thank you. <laughs> Excuse me, in San Francisco, and, that hap and this happened just this week, if you are homeless, you get free marijuana, free drugs of your choice and what you're addicted to, a free motel room, free tobacco, and free alcohol. Friends, I'm not making this up. This is true and it's happening in a city in our nation as we speak. Is that helping someone? Is that aiding their discomfort? Or is it making them dependent on us and on the government for the matter of power and control? We in the body of, of Christ, we, we need to perk up our discernment. We need to be more aware. We need to be more acutely aware of when someone is attempting to use power and control to exploit, to manipulate us. And I'm not smart enough in the medical field to know exactly when that's happening. But the gift of discernment is telling me that all is not honest. 
all is not well on those that are speaking on our behalf. This is not helping, it's enabling. The scripture that we just read in context is to support others that have problems and situations and grief, that we're here to support them spiritually, emotionally, and even with emergency essentials. We are not here to support a lifestyle. So how do we share others' burdens, especially in these troubled times? How do we support others in times of crisis? In death, I make it a promise and in a, in a, a promise to myself not to attempt to give a short course in theology on death and dying. I don't say to a family that is in the process of grieving, you got to be brave. How many times have you heard that when someone is called to the scene of someone that has just passed away? And really, the Christians, I think, are the one of the worst culprits of this. You have to gird up your loins. You have to be strong. You have to be a witness. You have to be a living testimony. You must be brave. How ridiculous. Will you let me say how stupid that is? It is really stupid. Have you ever gone through the loss of a loved one? Whether it be a maid or a child or a friend? And how have you felt when someone says, you need to get brave. You don't need to cry. You need to be a witness. If you feel that's the way it should be, you've never been confronted with death, with hurt, with heartache. One of the ways that we can sort, uh, support people going through that situation is not what we say. Many times it's just what we do. I remember early on in my ministry and I uh, was not very proficient in making death calls and uh, I was called to the house of a gentleman that had just passed away and the uh, bereaved wife was waiting for me at the front door and as I looked at her face and <clears throat> somewhat puzzled me she looked as though she had a, a feeling of relief that somehow me showing up just made her feel a little bit better and I I could not understand that and she said pastor I'm, I'm just so glad that you're here now and I thought, I hope she's not expecting a whole lot of words from me because I have no idea in the world what I'm going to say or how I'm going to make her feel better about her situation. So one of the few times in my life, you know what I did? Went into her living room and I sat down on the couch while other people started to come in and she was talking on the telephone. And I just sat there. I didn't say anything. And after a while, it came time for me to leave, and I asked her, I said, let's have a word of prayer together, and then I'll, I'll be leaving, and you can visit with your family and friends, and I left. Many months after that uh, funeral, I went out to visit the uh, new widow, and I said, how are things going? She said, they're going pretty well. And I said, well, I'm glad. And she said, Pastor... I want to share something with you and I don't want to feed your ego and I don't want to make your head bigger. But the ministry that you gave me pulled me through this whole thing. I said, what, what did I do? I don't remember doing or saying anything. She said, you were here. And every time I looked over at the couch, I was able to pull some strength and encouragement from you. That's one of the ways that we can support people and one of the ways that we can share in their burden. I know that this is hard. I know that you're going through a very difficult time. I know that this death has just made you devastated. I know that this divorce is just hurting you physically and mentally and spiritually. I know that this loss of a job 
is devastating. I know that you having a child and that child now being in trouble is awful to go through. Remember this, brethren, body of Christ. For those who tell us that eventually we can all come to a time of closure, we'll lie to you about other things too. I once had a man come to me in the office at the church and he said, Pastor, I, I have a problem and I would ask for your guidance and, and your help. And I said, what is it? He said, you know, my wife passed away before you came to be our pastor. And I said, yes, I, I know that. And he said, my problem is that every day I still think about her. Every day I want to tell her something. Every day I remember something that we shared together, a trip that we took. Every day I, I remember some ob obstacle, some catastrophe that we were able to hold hands and come through together. And it just seems like I'm carrying this grief around me, with me for too many years. Pastor, will you help me with my problem? I cannot take your problem, but I've got an idea. I think what you need in your particular case, and it's not in everybody's case, but I think in your individual case that what you need is a box of hurt. He said, excuse me? I said, you need a box of hurt. He said, I don't know what you're talking about. I said, I want you to go back home right now and I want you to find me a box. It can be wooden, it can be metal, it can be cardboard, but I want it to be mobile. And I want you to go home and I want you to get that box and I want you to bring it back here to the office. In about 30 minutes, he returned, and he had brought a little metal, looked like a cash box. And he said, Preacher, I did what you asked me to do, and here's the box. And I said, okay. So I, I took a piece of paper, and I wrote on it, Box of Hurt, and took a piece of scotch tape and taped that note over the top of it. And I opened up the box, and I said, we're not going to pray with our eyes closed. But I said, what I would like for you and I to do is just continue the conversation that we started earlier. And what I would like for you to do is just share out loud some of the hurt and the grief that you're going through. I'm not going to tell you what he said because that was between him and me and God. But he poured out his heart. He wept. And I said, okay, when, we, when he got done, I said, let's close the box. He closed the box and he said, Preacher, what do you want me to do with this box now? I said, I want you to take it back home. And I want you to put it someplace not conspicuous. At the same time, don't hide it. But put it in a place where maybe once a day you'll pass by it. And remember that in that box, is your hurt and your grief and your heartache. But remember also in that box is Jesus. A few weeks later, he came back and, and said, Pastor, he said, I still think about my wife. But he said, now instead of crying, I can smile. He said, every time I pass that box, I remember that. We can support each other not only in times of crisis, but in times of ministry. The Bible tells us to be careful and not cast pearls at swine's feet. When we share our faith and our gifts, don't drop the whole load and everything that we know about Christianity on them. They just may want you to sit there and be a source of energy and strength and comfort. You see, God's love is able to transcend from us to others in need. We don't always have to have words of wisdom or encouragement, 
or to be theological in nature. Sometimes we just need to be the vehicle whereby we just sit there and we allow God to love through us. Are you able to do that? Are you able many times, and I'm not suggesting that we, we don't have plans of action and doing things, and I know that we must be doers as well as hearers of the word, but there must be a balance there. John Wesley said this, Spend as much time on a situation as you need, but no more time that is required. I remember I had just been sent to a new appointment, and of course I was anxious and nervous, and I was backing my U-Haul truck into the driveway, and this group of, of people were waiting on me, and as I got out of the truck, we introduced ourselves to each other, and this one person came up to me and had a piece of paper in their hands, and I said, my name is Rick, and he told me his, and he said, I have a list here for you. And I said, okay, what is the list? He said, this list is made up of everybody that's a member of our church that has not attended in the last 20 years. And what we want you to do, your first priority is to go around and visit every one of these people. <laughs> now, I know the devil had to be rolling around. This had to be the happiest moment of this entire day for him. Wanted me to waste my time on people that had made it very obvious that they wanted nothing to do with the church. But the church wanted me to take up valuable time. And instead of ministering to the flock and to those that were willing to listen and hear the word, wanted me to go around and make ludicrous visits. Unfruitful. You say, preacher, you're standing in judgment. No. I said, I'll tell you what I will do. I will visit each one of these people that you have on this list one time. They will get one visit. I will be honest, I will be loving, and I will be sincere. But I'm not going to take your time, your time that you're paying me to minister, and waste it. Are you able to minister in times of ministry? Be careful not to cast pearls at swine's feet. Thirdly and finally, we can minister to people's needs and hurts as friends. Do you know that over 70% of successful therapy is not accomplished through counseling? That over 70% of successful counseling and therapy and rehabilitation is done when people are able to, in confidence, share with a friend or with a mate and are able to recover and go on the road to recover. We don't always need expert advice or wisdom. Sometimes we just need somebody sitting on the couch listening and feeling for all of our needs. Be careful. A true friendship is not automatic. It takes time and it takes experiences. My question is this. Are you a good friend, brethren, men and women of the scriptures? Would you choose yourself as a Christian friend? If someone came to you in need, are you ready to minister in word? Are you ready to minister maybe just in presence? Are you ready to minister in love and care and compassion and empathy and sympathy? I pray so. And I think today that my asking you to make a commitment to yourself and to God, Lord, I want to share the burdens with those that are hurt. I don't want to carry their burdens. I don't want to take their burdens away from them. But God, help me. Encourage me. Equip me to be able to serve them in a way that will help them be able to go by that little box in the hallway. And where those words are written down, my box of hurts 
and to be able to smile as they walk by. Let us become a group of Christians who are proficient not only in matters of polity and theology, but let us become helpers of those that are in need. God bless you. God bless whatever you're going through. God bless those around you that are ministering to you. For I close with God loves you. Amen. May the road rise to meet you May the wind blow at your back May the sun shine warmly on your face Once again, thank you for joining in with us. If you have a church home, we do encourage you to return to your pastor and to your local church. If you do not have a church home and live in the DeLand area, we would invite you to come visit with us. If you are unable to get out of your home or your handicap, please we invite you as we are going to uh, continue to have this type of service on Facebook. Let us pray. And now as Almighty God sits at the throne of heaven through the grace of his Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, be with us now and forevermore. Amen.